So it's an enormous pleasure and an enormous honor to be uh, here with you. Uh, you know, this is a fantastic crowd of, and a next generation of scientists. And so we are beholden to you. I hope you do a better job than we have. So, okay, I'll take you through essentially uh, my journey to science. I'll start out by what do I do as a scientist and then uh, uh, turn to a more uh, un uh, in, uh, uncomfortable position of talking about yourself. Scientists are very comfortable talking about science, but uh, less comfortable about talking about themselves. And then finally, I'll take you through a trip to Stockholm. So, <clears throat> what do I do as a scientist? I think all of you know this structure, and it's everything that uh, we do is dependent on this structure. This is DNA, and it was discovered by my mentor uh, and his colleague, Watson and Crick. It's a beautiful structure and made essentially for archiving information. Uh, the backbone is the uh, hand railings of the helix, and the bases are the steps. And it's a sequence of these steps uh, that actually are the information base. And we know, as you know, all the sequence for a mouse genome. We know it for a human genome. But it's simply a set of letters, four letters. And it's a sequence of these letters that are the text. And the question was, how can we start to figure out what that genome is all about? And one approach is simply to knock out a gene, then ask what are the consequences, and then from that infer its function. So I'll give you just one example of this. These are our patients. We chose the mouse because it is a mammal. And with respect to gene content, it's greater than 99% similar to us. So whatever we learn in the mouse, uh, will likely to be also true in humans. This is our, our diagram for gene targeting. The upper bar is your favorite gene, and the asterisk represents a modification that you introduced into this gene sequence in a test tube. On introduction into the cell, it combines with a very complex machinery and then searches the entire genome, three billion base pairs, finds the exact same sequence, then literally exchanges information. So that inf change that you created in a test tube is now in the chromosome of a living cell. If the recipient cell happens to be an embryonic stem cell, as shown here, a small clone of embryonic stem cells, mouse embryonic stem cells growing on a feeder layer, then there's a potential for generating a mouse from these cells that you've manipulated genetically. So, and then we do that simply by introducing the cells back into, a, uh, into an embryo, pre-implantation embryo. You can see the cells going into the uh, blastocyst. And at the bottom of the blastocyst are the cells that are going to give rise to the embryo proper. The air cells that you modified in cell culture will then combine with these uh, ES cell, uh, the uh, ECM in the bottom of the uh, embryo and then participate in making the embryo. And that's shown here. So here is a uh, schematic of the uh, blastocyst being injected by ES cells that you've modified in, the, uh, in cell culture. You make a little slit in the back, introduce them into the uterus, and then uh, let it proceed to uh, term. And if you've chosen code color alleles that distinguish the source of the ES cells from the blastocyst, then you can see that the next generation of mice, the chimeric mice, will be both brown, for example, in this case, brown and black. And then by breeding, you can get mice that are 100% derived from the ES cells that you modified in culture. So here's an example. Uh, we work with Hox genes. They're an interesting set of genes. They're involved in specifying the body plan, uh, making sure their head's here, my arms are here, and all the organs are in the appropriate position. And in this case, we're going, uh, we're working with Hox C13, and we've introduced a GFP molecule or a beta, beta galactosidase molecule, 
Beta-galactosidase is a bacterial protein that in the pre uh, presence of a substrate will turn the cells blue. And then GFP will make the uh, cells fluorescently green. And what you can see is that this gene is important for making whiskers. This gene is also important for making uh, fingernails. So here is uh, beta-galactosidase, and here is GFP. So we know where this gene is functioning. And then the question is, what is the function? And what we have to do is simply breed our mice to homozygosity. And we get the following result. Plus plus means homozygous uh, for the wild type gene, plus minus heterozygous. So heterozygous, no phenotype. But homozygous is alopecia, OK? Loss of body hair. And so and this mouse has no body hair. It also has defective fingernails, as you can see here. We can go to the human population and ask, are there people that are bald and have defective nails? And there are. We take their DNA, and they have a mutation in HOXC13. So that tells us two things. One is that what's happening in a mouse is identical to what's happening in humans, and also what this gene is functioning, what is pro uh, how it's operating in terms of the intact animal. Okay. So I want to indicate this all looks very smooth and everything works, but science isn't quite like that. And so I want to indicate that sometimes you do have uh, uh, hurdles put in front of you. In 1980, I submitted a grant when I, first, when I came to Utah to do gene targeting. And the response from the study section was that it was impossible. And their argument was fairly uh, rational. They simply said that the probability of the exogenous DNA finding the exact same sequence in a genome, 3 billion base, base pairs, is vanishingly small, and therefore the experiment will not work. We didn't take no for an answer. Uh, so what I did was simply dump all the money that I had for another grant and put it all into this project. Now, there's a risk. Four years later, you better have some results, or else you're never going to get a grant again. But fortunately, four years later, whoops, we, we got a reply. We had results. And their response was, we're glad you didn't follow our advice. So. <laughs> yeah. So they also had a little bit of humor. So next I'm going to go to the next part. But what I want to em em emphasize is you know, one of the important things about science is to go with your gut. There's a difference between persistence and stubbornness, but persistence is very important. And if your gut tells you you're on, you think you're on the right track, go for it, no matter what. So now I'm going to go into a, a sort of a very brief life history. I think you've already heard a little bit about it already. And things always start with your mother. Uh, there is another contributor, but uh, you know, she bears most of the load. <laughs> so this is my mother at a age about uh, 19. <laughs> she, was, uh, she was a poet, and she was uh, training at the Sorbonne. And there she became very politically minded and started to doing a lot of pamphleteering. And she knew that that was dangerous business, but she thought it was important, essentially, to use the pen to fight both fascism and Nazism uh, in Europe. And, and then uh, after uh, she things were getting hot, so she moved to the Sorbonne. Uh, she moved. I'm sorry to uh, a uh, up in. It's actually just north of Bolzano. This is a chalet, and an interesting aspect about the chalet is that if you actually looked across from the chalet, first of all. The house that I live in Utah sort of looks like this. And then the view is identical. You see essentially three tiers of mountains. And so when I took my wife there, she looked at it and she says, oh my god, 
you know, this is simply imprinting, just like a duck <laughs> and the ducklings following the mother duck. So it, it's strange that I ended up, and this is my mother in the foreground. And I've actually, this is uh, pre-birth. So I'm, I'm there, but not quite outside yet. <laughs> uh, the, in, uh, essentially in the spring of 41, the Gestapo came and, uh, to take her away to Dachau. And uh, at that time, I, was, uh, so I understood German as well as Italian, and so I understood what was going on, and I had an idea that uh, I wouldn't see her for a very long time. She had decided to give all her money to a family uh, that lived on this farm, uh, and, and so I lived there for about a year, and then the money ran out, and that's when I had to go into the streets and start going south, essentially migrating south uh, as time went on. And the other aspect is, uh, wasn't pointed out that the, my mother took actually two years to retrace my checks. That is to find me, and she finally did find me at a hospital uh, with typhoid and malnutrition. This is Dachau, uh, just a picture. I actually took my daughter there not too long ago just to see what was going on there. And it's, it's an amazing place. It's very aseptic. But the horrors that went there are amazing, just beyond belief. Uh, <clears throat> once she found me, she actually she bought me an outfit. And then uh, we went to Rome and then proceeded to get papers to go to uh, Pennsylvania, where her brother was living. And here we're going a century from a completely asocial situation in the streets of Italy to a commune uh, in Pennsylvania, which was 65 families living in, uh, together, owning everything in common. So I had a century now, instead of having no parents, I had 65 parents. <laughs> and they knew everything you were doing. But it was a fantastic place for kids because there were an enormous amount of activities. And so we profited from them. It was a Quaker community, and the Quakers don't believe in things, uh, accumulation. What they, mean, what they really believe in is stressing service. That is, what are you going to do for the world? And so that's how I was brought up. And it was their job, essentially, to convert me from a completely, almost like an animal, to a human being. And they uh, think they did a pretty good job. Uh, this is, whoops, come back. This is my uncle. He was a physicist, and um, a very good physicist. And he developed, for example, the first electron microscope. And here he's working on something that he actually regretted, and that's television. <laughs> there was no television allowed at our house, period. <laughs> But he was a very, very gifted, very bright person. And I think what really started me on the track to science. Uh, this is about, uh, this is a picture of me about uh, three days after arriving. I'm still in the same outfit that my mother bought me. It's a Tyrolean uh, outfit uh, when she uh, uh, came and found me in the hospital. From the, from the uh, uh, there, I went to Antioch, which is a very nice school. And it's a small liberal arts school in uh, Ohio. And what's good about it is that you work a quarter and you study a quarter. And you work a quarter and you study a quarter. And the jobs are all over the country and are related to whatever you're interested in. If you're interested in theater, you had theater jobs. If you're interested in science, you had uh, lab jobs. And I worked at places like MIT, Sloan Kettering, and so on. So I had an enormous amount of experience, two and a half years worth of laboratory experience by the time I graduated. And then from Antioch, I went to Harvard. And my mentor was Jim Watson. So, and he was a fantastic mentor. I mean, he is a, a very complicated being. He says many things that are regrettable. But on the other hand, uh, he was very supportive. He didn't teach me how to do science, 
but he's taught me how to look at science and how to look at a field and see what is there there that uh, might be worth contributing to. Every seven or 10 years, I actually change completely what I work on. And the reason for this is two. One is to scramble my neurons. I think an important part of science is that you never want to feel completely comfortable. Once you're comfortable, then you sit back and start chewing to, uh, potato chips and watching TV. Okay? That's comfort. That's, a, you know, that's heaven to most people. But in science, we always have to push ourselves into being uncomfortable and not knowing exactly what's going to come next and thereby uh, be motivated, essentially, to br open your eyes and look to see what's, uh, what's worthy uh, to really put your effort into. One of the uh, mottos he often told me was, you know, you could spend about the same amount of time working on a small problem compared to a big problem. If you work on a small problem, you'll get small answers. If you work on a big problem, you may be fortunate and get bigger answers. And then uh, I went to, I was on the faculty at Harvard after being a graduate student. I went to Harvard Medical School and it was very good. I mean, excellent people around you, but they didn't know two words. And one, one was synergy, okay? <laughs> they knew how to compete, <laughs> but they didn't know about synergy. And synergy, you know, two brains are always better than one. You always think that you, when you're working in science, you want to keep it all to yourself, but that's actually the worst thing you can do for it. If you synergize and work with other people, you'll expand essentially what is capable of doing and have a lot more fun doing it. And therefore, at the time, I heard that they were building a new department at Utah, and that is why I came to Utah. And here's a view from my window uh, in where I live in the springtime, in the fall, and the winter. So, and I think being able to look 60, 70, 80 miles in the distance also opens yourself up to thinking about very big problems. So finally about the trip to Stockholm. Here are the three uh, people that are involved. Uh, Oliver Smithies, uh, who just recently died about uh, six months ago. Uh, Martin Evans and myself. Martin Evans, he, uh, uh, was actually, uh, I should point that out, that uh, when I started uh, doing this, I knew I needed ES cells, mouse ES cells, and I showed you mouse ES cells, but they actually didn't exist, okay? So I knew I needed them, but uh, they, they simply, you know, nobody had ever made them. And then I heard a rumor that there's a person in uh, England, Martin Evans, who was trying to make ES cells and what, the way he was doing them, the, what existed were EC cells, embryonal carcinoma cells, which are isolated from uh, tumors. But those cells, and those cells contributed to some somatic tissue if you inject it into the embryo, but never to the germline. And so I, we knew that was a shortcoming. We'd have to make a mouse every generation, and that would have been very painful. And then, uh, then I heard a rumor that Martin Evans was doing this, so I called him up on the phone and I asked him, is the rumor correct? And he said yes. And then the next question was, can I come to your lab and learn how to work with these cells? And he said, sure. Synergy, okay. Separately, we, neither of us would have uh, gotten uh, anywhere. He had the cells, I had the technology. But together, we have both. And then all of a sudden now, the capability of making mice was a reality as opposed to a dream. <clears throat> so here is Stockholm. And St you know, the celebrations are in the winter. Stockholm is way north. It's very cold. And there's only a few hours of light uh, during the winter time. So you'd think that would be an awful place to be, but it's actually really beautiful because the sea, the ocean, inundates the city, and it's like fingers going through the city. So wherever you are, you're looking at boats. And so it's beautiful, even in the winter. This is the hotel we still stayed at, 
beautiful hotel. I'll tell you one short little story about it. I mentioned that just at dinner time, uh, lunch time, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, and when you first arrive, you arrive in a limousine and they take you up and there are thousands of people waiting to, you, uh, for you to sign autographs. It's a very you know, big deal in, in, in uh, Stockholm, uh, the Nobel Prize. And then three days later, Bruce Springsteen shows up. <laughs> All the crowd disappeared, whoosh, <laughs> right over to Bruce Springsteen. So it tells you, you know, what a real rock star is all about. <laughs> so here is the assemble for the uh, Nobel Prize. Get a little closer look, and there's beautiful flowers everywhere. And you're wondering where do flowers come from in the wintertime in Stockholm? They all come from Italy. Uh, and also the decorum. You know, it's, it's a very... Uh, They've been doing it for over 100 years, and so they have a lot of history to it and a lot of customs to it. And then you figure out, you know, how do you know what to do? But it's very easy. You just look at the king. And if the king stands up as he is here standing up, then you stand up. If he sits down, you sit down. So it's very easy. There's also the queen, and the next future queen is also there. <clears throat> Uh, this is a funny picture. <laughs> and then here is receiving the Nobel Prize. So, the other thing that's wonderful about life is you always get surprises. And the surprise for me was this picture right here. That is, I met a half-sister that I didn't even know existed. She knew of our existence. She knew about myself and my mother, but she thought we had long died uh, in the Second World War. And then out came newspapers saying, Mario Capecchi won the Nobel Prize, and they show a picture. And she recognized the name and made the connection. And we met, and I looked at her, and I said, you know, and it's obvious I didn't need, need any DNA tests. Poor woman looks just like me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>